Hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the Ulster Society Young Professional Groups webinar on networking today. Something I think we all need a bit of help with over the last two years in our pajamas. This is the final web series um, in a series over the last few months, which has covered topics such as time management and stress management. All videos will be available on the website to revisit along with other web series such as yoga and meditation that we've held. The Young Professionals Group hold a number of networking and development events throughout the year. The next one being our gin jaunt at the end of May, um, which I hope some of you will be able to join us on and get to meet in person again and use some of the skills we're developing today. Our session today is hosted by James McSporn. James is a leadership development consultant who works with leaders across a load of different levels and sectors, including professional services, legal, finance, media, I could go on. Uh, he helps organizations and individuals with culture, team dynamics, personal and professional development. Before I hand over to James, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Van Rath, um, for hosting all of our webinars and our successful event uh, last night in Fratelli's. Um, and I'd like to now invite Henry Webb to say a few words. Over to you, Henry. Thanks, Dylan. Um, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's, uh, as always, an absolute honour to be part of uh, the series. It's been uh, just fantastic to get some real insight uh, and support uh, right across the Institute. Um, very brief introduction uh, in terms of, of us, uh, Van Rath, uh, Northern Ireland's largest uh, recruitment and strategic uh, career support service here uh, based in Belfast. Um, and we cover uh, right across financials from park calls uh, right through to CFOs and FD supports throughout their career and their moves. Um, and we also um, cover all industries, uh, including uh, practice as well as public and private sectors. So uh, I know a great opportunity market is, is amazing at the moment. So we're always looking for uh, aspiring and uh, aspirational accountants to, to chat to, so um, I, I'm no doubt uh, I'll be speaking with, with uh, some of the members in due course, but um, very much looking forward to our session today, um, so it gives me great pleasure to uh, hand over to James. Thanks Henry and thanks Neela, uh, really great to be with you all, my name is James McSporn, I am based in Edinburgh, although I'm married to a Belfast girl and I'm just about to move over to Belfast in July, so hopefully I'll get to meet some of you actually in person uh, after the summer been involved with with the society over a couple of years now and, and always really enjoy the events and was very jealous of seeing some of the pictures of your cheese and wine night last night so hope that um, you're all well this morning and this afternoon rather let me just share my screen and we will get started so um networking and making valuable connections now it's worth saying i actually don't love the term network or networking, uh, which probably makes a, a terrible introduction to this seminar. But the reason I don't love the term networking is because for a lot of people, it conjures up an image of standing in a conference somewhere with a glass of warm Prosecco in your hand, making awkward small talk with someone, looking for an excuse to get out of the conversation. And for some people, that is the extent of their networking. Uh, and other people think about networking as, you know, I've, I've got a black book and I'm, I'm trying to build as many connections as I can to fill up that black book so that it can further my career. And for some people, that's networking. But for the sake of this, I'd love to consider networking as just simply how do you just keep building relationships, both personal and professional, although the focus will be a bit more on the professional just now. How do you keep building relationships so that the world of work just becomes far more interesting because it's better when you can build it with other people and so that you might be open to opportunities to help other people and to be helped by other people. And so today, you, you don't necessarily need me to just say, look, make eye contact and have a good firm handshake and remember to, you know, tie a good Windsor knot on your tie or have a nice dress or whatever it might be. Um, I, what, what I'd love to get at is some psychology behind how do you approach building a network? How do you approach building relationships, both personally and professionally, like you say? And how can you use some psychology to understand what you're going to bring to that conversation and to understand how to make the conversations much more interesting as well? So that's the plan um, as to where we're going to go. 
And to just give you a brief overview, I, I will be finishing up at about quarter past one and we'll have some time to have some questions as well. So this is going to be boring if it's just my voice. So please do hold on to questions, take notes, do all that kind of thing. But the plan is uh, we're going to first of all talk about commitment. Um, from a psychological lens, how curious are you about actually what are you committed to? As an accountant or um, as, a, as a young professional or as someone that's trying to balance work life and, and uh, maybe push forward in the career, actually, what are you committed to? And so then within the context of networking and building up relationships, how are you expressing that commitment and articulating that commitment? So I want to have a look at some psychology surrounding how can you understand what you're committed to and get some clarity on your commitment. Because actually, in my experience, when it comes to networking, if you can have some clarity on your commitment and what you're really trying to achieve and who you're trying to be and what kind of impact you're committed to making on the world, then networking becomes much easier when you have that lens for it. Then in light of recognizing what you might be committed to or a number of things that you're committed to, then how do you start enrolling people in that commitment? How can you, at a networking event or just through building relationships, how can you say, look, here's what I'm committed to, I want to understand what you're committed to, and let's try and enroll you in a future or enroll you in a version of my commitments. So we're going to look at some factors that makes enrollment happen, um, or it certainly makes enrollment much more likely. And then we're going to finish up with some really practical top tips on how do you actually begin to form agreements with people. You know, when it comes to networking, it's all very well having a clear idea of what you're committed to. And it's all very well trying to enroll people into that and try to be enrolled into other people's um, commitments. But actually, if you can't form agreements and you can't actually start to make a difference in the world and a difference to um, what you're trying to achieve, then actually all of the first two elements kind of just end up falling on deaf ears. So that's the plan. Um, over the course of, of, of this, I'll, I'll have some deep dive moments. I'll have some moments where you can reflect and I'll have some moments where uh, we'll have something super practical and, and the chance to, to cover that as well. So hopefully, if you're here thinking, I just want to be better in networking events with the warm champagne and building my black book, there's something for you here. And hopefully, if you're thinking, do you know, I'm just curious about something that's a bit broader about how do I develop my career and build relationships particularly this side of COVID and this side of having to um, speak with people in person. And hopefully there's something for us all. Uh, so that is the plan. I, I'll, I'll have my slide deck on, on the go. Uh, so do keep your eyes on the screen. And uh, like I say, make a note of questions or anything like that. We'll have 15 minutes at the end to, to have some questions. So to begin, commitment. Um, I want to draw your attention to the guy you see on the screen just now. He is called Werner Erhardt. Um, he is a psychologist come philosopher, come sort of business theorist. And for those of you that are Googling him right now as I'm chatting, I would advocate that he is incredible at some areas of helping people take responsibility for their career and for their life. And he's incredible at articulating things to do with commitment. But I also wouldn't advocate him as a beacon of shining light um, from an accountancy perspective. Apparently, he's still not allowed in the US because he owes them so much tax and hasn't paid for so long. Uh, when you see some of his videos, sometimes he's a wee bit full on and can be a bit heavy handed. So I wouldn't say everything he says is amazing. But within the lens of commitment to help us understand networking, Werner Erhardt has some really useful uh, things to say. And this is one of them. He says this. Behind every behavior is a commitment to something. So just take a second to reflect on that. Um, what behaviors have you encountered already this morning in your working morning? Particularly behaviors that you think, I'm not quite sure what they were up to, or what did she mean by that? Or what on earth was he trying to do there? What's it like to suddenly ask the question of, actually, what was that behavior a commitment to? So even just now, you have um, exhibited a behavior by being on a webinar for an hour on your Friday lunchtime. What is that a commitment to? What are you committed to in terms of networking or building a network or creating valuable connections? And to understand your commitment is to first of all say, well, let's get behind some of the behaviors. And that's exactly why I don't just want to stand here and give you an hour of saying things like, 
shake hands and make eye contact. I want to really help you get under the surface to say, well, those behaviors are all very well, but how do they align with what you're committed to? Another statement about commitment is what you're committed to impacts your actions and it's revealed by your actions. So it's getting a little bit deeper. What's it like to look over the actions and the decisions you've taken over the last couple of weeks and ask the question, how does that show what you're genuinely committed to? When you finish work and you close your laptop over, how do you spend the next couple of hours in the evening? And what does that show you about what you're committed to in terms of your personal life? But also how might that impact your professional life as well? And actually the deepest level of commitment is what you're committed to or, or your prime commitment stays the same regardless of the circumstance. It's who you remain regardless of the circumstance. And so this is a bit of an introduction into commitment to say, look, within the, the, the lens of networking, if you can go out into the world and have some clarity on what you're committed to or who you're committed to being or what kind of impact you'd like to have on your work environment or the business that you work with or the clients that you work with or whatever it might be, the networking becomes a bit easier because you create a lens for yourself with which to communicate. So I want to give you some ideas about how you might unpack what you're committed to. And the reason for this, um, this is WH Murray. He led the Scottish Himalayan exhibition. And uh, he said this, until one is committed, there's hesitancy. There's a chance to draw back, always in effectiveness. Concerning all acts of initiative and creation, there's one elementary truth the ignorance of which kills countless ideas and splendid plans. That the moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves too. In other words, to paraphrase what that's saying, when you have clarity about what you're committed to and you align your actions and behaviors to see that commitment move forward, then actually things start falling into place because until you're committed, you can always give yourself the chance to, to pull back. So think of what would be your ideal career aspiration for, you know, three, four or five years time from now. How are you at declaring that as a commitment to the world? Because that's going to impact how you're going to network. Because actually, in my experience of, of coaching leaders at all levels and people that wouldn't consider themselves leaders, it is the ones that haven't yet declared a commitment or haven't yet got clarity in their commitment, they end up kind of just floating around. And like the quote says, it kills countless ideas and splendid plans. However, it is the ones that have some clarity on what they're committed to and who they're committed to being, that suddenly the world starts kind of falling into place for them. So how clear are you on what you're committed to? Because that's gonna make networking a, a whole lot easier. Uh, so for me, for example, um, one of the things that I'm committed to is moving to Belfast. Um, marrying a Belfast girl, it was absolutely non-negotiable. But of course, as soon as uh, we got married, we sort of knew that was a broad commitment. But it wasn't until we actually bought our house, um, at which we did last summer, and we've been doing it up over the last year, and we're moving in July. It wasn't until we sort of declared, look, we're committed to this, and we're moving over to Belfast in July, that suddenly you start noticing loads of opportunities come up suddenly potential clients in Belfast are reaching out to me saying, hey, I heard that you, I heard that you're moving to Belfast. We'd love to grab a coffee when you're next over here. Or potential clients that are interested in, in uh, conversations about what's going on in Belfast are saying, oh, I've, I've always wondered what's happening in Belfast. Can I pick your brains about that? Can you help me understand? Can you make some introductions? See, it, it was the moment that I committed myself to saying to the world, and it sounds a bit cheesy, but saying I'm moving to Belfast, it's suddenly providence moves as well. You, you notice opportunities. And so this is why I, I think it's really important for, for everyone here to have some kind of clarity on what are you committed to? Because if you can start talking about that and start practically taking some steps forward in that commitment, then when it comes to networking, you'll find that, that conversations, you'll be looking subconsciously for opportunities to steer it in the direction of your commitment. Whereas if you don't have clarity about what you're committed to, then actually networking can be a bit difficult and can just be sort of flailing around, hoping to find something interesting to talk about, if it's the rugby or if it's music or if it's the weather or whatever it might be. 
So how do you get clarity on your commitments? I'm going to walk you through um, a, a model by a psychologist called Robert Diltz. It's called his logical levels. And, and what I'll do is I'll walk you through the model. He explains his view on how someone's commitment ends up actually coming out into the world. And then I'll give you a couple of other examples of, of what commitment might, might look like. And then I'm going to give you a self-reflection exercise. You'll have uh, about five minutes or so to genuinely um, try an exercise that might give you some clarity in what you're committed to. So then that will frame the, the last half of what I have to say. So Robert does his logical levels. He says every human being has a purpose or a set of purposes. So it's worth noting that... Um, commitment isn't just about this one thing you know it could be a number of things you're committed to but he says the primary way that your purpose starts to work its way out is through your identity it's how you describe yourself so for those of us that we call ourselves uh, parents that shows something about your, your purpose in relation to uh, your children for those of us that would describe ourselves as, as accountants, it shows us something about your purpose in terms of your career. And for, the, for those of us that would describe ourselves as sports fans, it describes your purpose in terms of what you're committed to for, for that sports team. And even, of, of course, I, I know it's a contentious issue for many, but the very fact that over the last couple of years, um, there has been such a conversation about people's pronouns and how they'd like to be identified. Um, we've been seeing a big swing in terms of that being a conversation that didn't exist even a few years ago. That also reveals something about what people feel is, is at their core, at their kind of purpose, or like what or who they're called to be in the world is how they identify themselves. Then based on your identity, you then start to build a bunch of beliefs about what's true and what isn't in the world. And you might have heard that said, uh, whether you believe you can or whether you believe you can't, you're probably right. So if you identify yourself as a, as a sports team member, you're probably going to build a bunch of beliefs around how much you can contribute to that sports team. If you identify yourself as um, a potential CFO one day, you're going to build a bunch of beliefs about what is, what, what is uh, possible for you. Equally, if you identify yourself as I'm never going to be a CFO one day, then you're going to build a bunch of beliefs that might form glass ceilings over you as well about what's possible one day for you. Because those beliefs start to inform your capabilities, according to Robert Diltz. And your capabilities are basically a suite of behaviors that you create for yourself that you can, that you can choose based on what you believe is true. I um, don't know if anyone's seen the, the 14 Peaks uh, Netflix show. I, I, uh, I'm reading Nims Thy Purge's book at the moment. And he is an incredible mountaineer and he uh, beat the world record for climbing the 14 highest peaks in the world. Uh, the the um, record had been like seven and a bit years and he did it in literally like seven months. And what is so true throughout the, the documentary and the book is his sense of be belief based on how he describes himself as um, a you know, number of different things amongst the mountaineering. He has a belief about, I believe that this is possible, is, is the whole thing is project possible. And as a result of how he believes that's true, he builds himself a suite of capabilities, which says, I, 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 I can mountaineer at a certain level that makes that belief come true. Because from your capabilities, then comes your behavior, comes with the way that you then interact with the environment. So if you have a look at the screen there, you can see how this is how Robert Dills would say your purpose starts working its way out through to the environment. And actually, in, in terms of this uh, conversation, purpose and identity is really what I'm referring to as, as commitment. What are you committed to? Therefore, what do you believe is true or not true in the world? And then how do you start building capabilities and behaviors to interact with your environment? And all networking is, is behavior and environment interacting with each other. Now, here's the thing. If you want to change your behavior, so if you're here thinking, I just want some, uh, some top tips on how to behave in a networking environment, then actually, you need to go one layer behind. You need to say, well, what capabilities have you decided that you have that you can behave from? Is there a different choice? Oh, right. You don't think you can choose a different type of behavior or capability. What, help me understand more about what you believe to be true about yourself. Okay, well, if you don't believe this, then what does that show that you're committed to? 
you see how when you start working back it gives you um, a whole load of clarity and actually can take you quite deep quite quickly now the thing is very often um what happens is people come away from a webinar like this and they think yeah i want to be really clear about what i'm committed to and then they get to an awkward networking event or they get to a, a chance to maybe meet someone for a coffee that's a potential client or <coughs> you know, meet up with someone from Van Rath to talk about potential opportunities, and then this ends up happening. Their environment plays a, such a factor in them where they then feel awkward, or they then um, can't hold conversation, or they kind of forget their commitment. This happens in the work environment all the time. You see people leaving webinars like this inspired, and then before they know it, back to the ground, the environment has an impact on their commitment. What I'm really interested in is how can each of us on this webinar get so much clarity what we're committed to that this, if you have a look at your screen, happens instead. Where your commitment actually starts to change the environment around you. And that is one of the goals when it comes to networking. How can you have such clarity on what you're committed to that you start impacting networking environments? We start impacting environments where you're building valuable connections and actually they become much more valuable. So before I give you the chance to have a little five minute self-reflection, for some people, the word commitment, the word purpose might do something. I want to just throw up a couple of other terms that you might use instead of commitment, just in case the term commitment doesn't work for you. You might want to say at the core, what's at the core of you? Robert Diltz calls it the congruent self. So if you feel like you're being really congruent, what does that look like in a networking uh, environment? Dick Schwartz says expansive core. And I love that. I'm not a, a DIY person at all. My wife will testify to that. Um, but you know the expand, expanding foam that builders use where there's a little gap and they fill it and it goes like that. I love the idea of the expansive core being how can you get clarity in what you're committed to so that you just can't help but kind of go and impact people around you? What would it be like if the next time you were networking with someone, whatever that means for you, that your core was so expansive and, and contagious that they couldn't help but say, wow, she is so committed to this. Wow, they're really committed to seeing that happen. Patricia Clarkson calls it your first nature. Alexander Lowen calls it your core. jean Drac Rousseau calls it your perfect nature. Jim Nish calls it your unique contribution. A bunch of different psychologists and philosophers there giving words really to that same thing, which is, what are you committed to? What kind of impact do you want to make on the world? What kind of career do you want to have for yourself? What kind of person do you want to be? What kind of reputation do you want to have? What kind of opportunities would you like to experience? If you can get some clarity as to what's going on for you, then it can really help bring some uh, useful lenses that you can network through. So here's the exercise. It literally is as straightforward as talking yourself through the um, Robert Dills' logical levels. So just flash it up here and there's a couple of prompting questions and then we'll have about five minutes, like I say, to reflect. So first of all, consider your environment. What context would you like to work in? Take honestly about, uh, I'm going to talk you through the questions and I'll give you five minutes, but when you do this, take about 10 seconds to consider this because the nature of the, the exercise is it takes you uh, deeper, quicker anyway. So what context would you like to work in? You know, maybe think about a business you'd like to work in or a, um, or, or, or a role you'd like or an environment you like, just whatever, com whatever comes up to you as the first answer, just what context would you like to work in? Then we start chunking it down, and that's the coaching term for this, is chunking down behind the, the layers. Okay, well, tell me about the behaviours. What sort of projects do you imagine being involved in? And then you chunk down further, you say, and how would you do that? So when you consider the projects you imagine being involved in in that context, what capabilities would you personally bring to that? What experiences do you have that you could bring to that? Then you chunk down further and say, well, why do you want to work in that way? Why are those the capabilities that you bring? What is it you think that would be achieved if you worked in that way? Which then leads you on to the next chunking down question of, so then what does that show about who you are? And then finally, so what are you committed to then? And how does that show up in other areas of your work and your life? And one of the things I've noticed is that having run this exercise with thousands of people 
when it comes to that purpose answer, what are you committed to? Very often it's really just like straightforward. Sometimes it's a simple two or three word answer. And we almost sort of search for it to be complicated, but actually sometimes there's something about just putting it into a couple of words where you think, wow, this is quite impactful. So I, I once ran this with the, the Welsh Rugby Union. Uh, they were a client of mine just before COVID. And we were in the Millennial Stadium in Wales looking out over the pitch on one of the corporate boxes. It was amazing. And of course, everybody said, yeah, I'm committed to rugby. Yeah, committed to the sport, love the sport. And we did this exercise. Rather than five minutes, they had 40 minutes to coach each other through it. And it was amazing when they came back into the room because there were all different technical specialists there. They were all working within the commercial and operational side of, of the business. But there was one guy there, he said, from going through this, the what context would you like to work in? I started off by just saying, I just want to work in rugby. And then as he chunked down, he said, I realize I'm just really committed to families having the chance to interact with each other. He said, I, I look out at the stadium on a game day and I love seeing families coming together to support their team. There was another person on that leadership team who, as a result of going through this exercise, said, I just realized that what I'm really committed to is helping people have aspirations for health and fitness. There's another person that said, I'm just really committed to the spirit and the, 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 the kind of Welsh patriotic opportunities that we have here. So I really encourage you, if your context is just simply, I just want to work in accounts, that's great. That's okay. Go with that. And then chunk down and just see what comes up for you. Um, you're not going to have to share anything. And you're not going to have to uh, yeah, write to me and tell it or anything like that. So it's just the chance, five minutes just now, grab a piece of paper or make some notes on your phone or whatever it is, with then the final question of how might you articulate this commitment in a networking context? So I'm going to give you five minutes. It is at 12.59 just now, so we'll go until 1.04 because uh, we're tight on time. And uh, um, I'll go camera off just now, but if anyone wants to speak, then you can... Um, drop a question in the chat or whatever and we can go but yeah we're going to 104 and um, give you the chance to have this self-reflection so that you've got a lens then for the next uh 10 minutes of, of us chatting so come back at 104 great <clears throat> we'll move on there um hopefully that's really useful i probably revisit this exercise um maybe every couple of months i revisit it um again it's really clear uh, or it's worth clar clarifying that it's not, not like there's one commitment or there's just one purpose, but actually for, for most of us, there's probably a couple of commitments floating around in there. And so this exercise, it can be done in five minutes as we've, as we've just had there, or it can be, like I say, a 40 minute uh, deep dive with someone else helping you work through it. And the key thing within, within this seminar about networking is to say, well, how can you articulate that commitment in a networking context? Because when it comes to networking, if you have some clarity about the direction you see yourself traveling in or the kind of things that you'd like to have an impact on, then it can start steering your conversation in, in a networking context as well. Whether that's just meeting someone for coffee spontaneously or whether that's in a, in a conference or a networking environment. So I'd love to move on to talk about enrollment. And again, I'm actually going to stick with uh, some Werner Erhardt here. He actually has informed most of, of uh, the, the subject for this webinar. Enrollment really at its heart is about saying, how can you take something that you're committed to, show it to the world in a way that other people want to get involved, that other people want to roll their shoulders up and say, yeah, I want to get stuck into that. And of course, when it comes to networking, that is one of the main reasons for networking is to say, look, how, how can I just share my commitment with people and see who wants to come and join me? But actually, even more importantly than that is how can you get clear on other people's commitments as well and potentially be enrolled into their commitment and then enroll each other in something that works out quite well for both of you. So Werner Erhardt has a number of enrollment factors that he says, look in life, if you wanna get people on board and you wanna help them uh, come and understand what you're doing and get them involved, there's a number of things that you wanna have in place. First of all, is keep it mutually beneficial. So you're in a networking environment, you've done the last exercise based on Dilts' logical levels, and you have a clear articulation of your commitment. 
Now, brilliant, hold that, put that to one side. Now it's time to be interested rather than interesting. If you want to kill a networking opportunity or the opportunity to create a valuable connection, then talk about yourself. <laughs> and we all know what it's like to be stuck with someone that doesn't know how to ask questions. I actually was speaking to a client the other day and they said, I hate networking. And I said, why do you hate networking? And he said, oh, because I don't have anything interesting to say about myself. And you're like, well, you sound like you're loads of fun to speak to if you're just trying to find some, something interesting for yourself. Ask questions. Be interested in what someone else is committed to. You know, you've got that um, exercise from before. You might not necessarily bring a notebook with you and every time you meet someone new, you like work the way through chunking down the questions. But you've kind of got a broad understanding now of, yeah, do you know what? I get that behind someone's behaviours, it might be a commitment to something. So rather than just telling them about my commitment, I'm going to do my best to ask questions to really unpack what they're committed to, to really unpack what might be behind their behaviours. Your job isn't to be interesting when you're networking primarily, although that comes into it sometimes. Your job is to be interested. Then be compelling. What is... Or what are some of the ways that you could talk about what you're committed to that makes people think, wow, that's really exciting. Tell me more, I'm really intrigued about that. What's it like for you to be sort of unashamedly, and we're not very good at this, um, at Scotland and Northern Ireland especially, and uh, Ireland as well. Um, I'm not sure if there's anyone who's south joining us. We, we're not very good at sticking our heads up above the parapets and saying, yeah, here's this exciting thing. But actually, what would it be like to just experiment with articulating your commitment in a way that really is compelling? One of the things that Verna Earhart says is um, that the lowest form of living your life is the reasonable one. He says, whatever you, um, wh whenever you find people who want to take the next step or want to push forward in their career, the ones that are more likely to hold themselves back are the ones that can have all the reasons for why it wouldn't work. And so that's why a compelling enrollment might involve unreasonable outcomes. Now, I know that speaking to a bunch of accountants, um, a lot of your job is to be reasonable. You can't just write to HMRC and say, hey, I just decided to do this unreasonable thing with the accounts this year. Like, that's not going to work. But what I am talking about is when it comes to your own ambitions, your own future commitments, what's it like to be unreasonable? What's it like to share it with your, with your spouse, or your partner, or your siblings, or your family, or your friends, or your colleagues, and for them to say, whoa, that's a wee bit unreasonable, that's quite ambitious, and for you to say, that's exactly why it excites me. What's the most compelling version of what you're trying to do? Then get some skin in the game. So just actually take action. The world's full of people that will talk about their, their future commitments. But actually, very few will take the action to say, I'm speaking to this person about that. I've, uh, I, I've met someone from Van Rath about this potential opportunity because I want to I move on. I've explored a different type of um, a, a, a training or qualification. I'm meeting with someone who works in this industry that I want to find out more about. Get some skin in the game, actually do something, take some action. Because when it comes to enrolling in a networking environment, if you can be compelling and show where you've got skin in the game, it's a, there's a good chance that actually that creates potential for other opportunities for them to say, oh, I could help you do this. Or tell me more about that. It's really interesting. Which then brings you to the final element, which is be tangible, get pragmatic. One of the things about enrollment is, is you're holding this future commitment on one hand, and then on the other hand, you're also holding that, and what's the practical next step? What can I do? Who am I speaking to? Where is my skin in the game? So when it comes to networking, you want to enroll people in what you're doing. And one of the best ways to do that is to follow these examples, is how do you make it mutually beneficial? Find out about them. How can you articulate something that's quite compelling? How can you show where you've got some skin in the game and make it really tangible? And it's worth saying that networking doesn't just have to happen within a five minute conversation where you've got an elevator pitch and you have to do all that. Well, of course, sometimes it does. Sometimes there's those sort of speed dating type networking events. Sometimes this process of being mutually beneficial, compelling skin and against tangible might happen over the course of two years. Um, 
within my consultancy, uh, because I'm just a, a, a one man band at the moment, actually, there's a lot of, of people who are in my network who are actually as a result of, of working with them for a couple of years or, or just meeting them for a couple of years work ends up coming up and I'm able to help them after a couple of years. It might not happen just instantly. And I'd encourage you to hold that in your mind when you consider networking, whatever that means for you is networking might not necessarily look like a clear result in the moment, but it could be something that takes years. So give you an example, I, I work with, um, well, actually, I knew an HR director, I think her role is uh, head of people for a couple of years, she works for this really cool um, media agency. And I, I would sort of drop her an email, see how she's doing. I was just on the be interested rather than interesting constantly. Uh, we got on quite well and we'd meet for coffee every now and again. We got on quite well. And no ever formal work had ever taken place between the two of us. And then um, she phoned me up one day and I said, oh, tell me about what's going on. How are you get nice to catch up with that? She said, well, we've got this real problem. We're investing, uh, we've not invested in people that have just become line managers. So there's a real lack of needs. And so at that stage, I thought there's potentially an opportunity to, to enroll. Um, sorry, she said, I've not been invested in, in, in our line managers. There's now a lack of skill and there's a need to develop those line managers in terms of leadership which is what I do. So I thought, right, okay, maybe it's a chance to enroll here. So I already was interested and I knew that what she needed to do with her business was invest in new line managers. And so I told her a couple of compelling stories about some of the similar work I'd be doing with other similar clients. I said, actually, unreasonably, we've really seen some leaders really grow and develop within the space of literally two days, you know, as we've really pushed them and coached them and got below the, the surface. And I said, um, why don't I go away and why don't I design a program for what, what it might look like for you? I put some skin in the game. At this stage, she hadn't agreed to pay me any money. She hadn't said anything. I said, why don't I show you the kind of thing I might be able to do? And if I send it to you next week, would you be up for looking over it? She said, yeah, definitely. Now they have turned into one of my um, most consistent clients. I'm working with them constantly and we're rolling out that program um, across the whole business. And that's led onto more coaching opportunities and all that kind of thing. And that's because the mutually beneficial um, stage of the thing took years uh, of just being interested. And then as I was interested and genuinely got to know our business, then I found opportunities to maybe do some of the compelling skin in the game and tangible action. So what would it be like for you to have clarity in your commitment so that you can then enroll people? And then really practically, and this is what I'm going to finish on here, is start forming agreements with people. Agreements are the way that you get tangible change to happen. Agreements are how you do the holding on the one hand a big commitment and on the other hand the practical next step. Your agreements are the glue that holds that together. Your commitment gives you the rudder. The enrollment allows you to build valuable connections and have other people involved in it. And agreements are the really practical things that if you can look for opportunities to form agreements with people, then uh, you're much more likely to see your commitment move further forward and someone else's commitment move further forward as well. And Werner Erhardt, to just finish on this, he has two uh, metaphors for about how we might form agreements. He says the first is, um, there's two types of conversations you can have. He says the first is a conversation where you're in the crowd. So you think of a rugby match, what's going on in the crowd? You know, yeah, it's important. It creates a good atmosphere. But ultimately, what people in the crowd are talking about is their opinions, it's their desires, and it's irrelevant. It doesn't impact the game at all. And I guarantee if you... Um, even just this afternoon, the meetings that you've got coming up, if you listen through the lens of who's in the crowd at the moment, you will hear so many people that just really just tell you about what they think should happen and what they'd like to see happen, but actually don't create any agreements around you. Those are the people that say, yeah, I'll follow up with you at some point, or yeah, it'd be great if someone could do this. Oh, it'd be good if this project could get pushed forward. It's ultimately irrelevant because what you want to do is get on the pitch. And being on the pitch when it comes to practical leadership and networking and, and personal development comes down to two things. It's actions and it's time scales. Actions are requests or offers. And the time scale is obviously when it's gonna happen. So it may be that within a networking opportunity, 
you have a really clear action. You know, it's, oh, brilliant. I'd love it if I could have an introduction to this person. And I'd love it if you were able to do that over the next couple of weeks, you know, maybe by the end of the month. Yeah, bro, you've got, you've got an action, you've got a time scale. Or it might be, it might be that you're you're doing um, doing the much longer term thing, which is, oh gosh, I uh, would love to meet you for coffee. Let's meet in three months' time. You've got an action and you've got a time scale, and that is how you start forming some meaningful connections. Is within the people in your network, what are the agreements that you've got in place, what are the requests and the offers, and the time scales? And I guarantee, even this afternoon, when you go into meetings this afternoon, you will hear people that are in the crowds. And one of the most effective things you can do is to pull them onto the pitch and turn it into an agreement. And so I'd love to just finish up by uh, giving you all uh, an offer, uh, because the irony of this is I'm also up for networking as well. I'm going to be in, in Belfast and up for meeting anybody. And so my offer is, please, um, please reach out to me. Uh, I'll be here at the end of July and you can, you can reach out to me then. So I'm just going to flash up a couple of, couple of prompts that you can screenshot just now that summarizes this networking thing. First of all, prepare. So articulate what you're committed to over the next while. Prepare, where do you have some skin in the game already? Or how could you get some more skin in the game? That's all the pre-networking, the pre-building relationship stage. Then when you find yourself in a networking situation, whatever it might be, then ask and listen for what they're committed to and identify where there might be some mutually beneficial commitments and then finish up with agreements. What can you offer a request and what time scale? I'm going to put up my last closing slide in five seconds. If you want to screenshot this, you've got five seconds to do it. And then to just back up my offer, um, there is my, my number, my email address. Uh, would love if I can help any of you with uh, either talking about things like this or anything else to do with um, uh, behaviours, relationship, leadership, personal development, um, then I will be in Belfast by the end of July. And so my offer is... Uh, Give me a ring. Let's let's grab a coffee, uh, and I'll be there by the end of July. I will stop sharing now. Hand over to you, you Nula. Thank you so much, James. That was great. Um, I've been frantically scribbling away, um, <laughs> just working through your commitments and things. And um, I was actually going to ask, and then you answered: Is can you have more than one? You know, a lot of us maybe have are involved in different things or have, have different hats in the places that we work or things that we're involved in outside. So um, I think it's really useful to work through that depending on uh, what your what your hat is that particular day or for that particular event. Uh, so really, really helpful. Yeah, no, thank you. And and you're right, you know, depending on the hat, you'll find out more about your your commitments. And I think that, I mean, you know, from, from speaking to much older, wiser people than me, I don't think there's ever any sense of like, you arrive, you know, no one in their 80s would say, this is the one thing that I had to do with my life. But I think that what people just get better at doing is balancing the, the combination of commitments you find, you know, so you can be as committed to your family as you are to your career as you are to some, you know, hobby as you are to something else. And, and I think the question is, how do you keep learning to hold all of those together in, in a way that helps them all all benefit so yeah you're right is that um suppose is that maybe one of the issues that that is a challenge for people in trying to find out what they're committed to is maybe that you know are they overloading themselves with the need to to be committed to a million things instead of i suppose a manageable amount yeah it's it's a good question i think if you remember one of the first uh, slides I put up um, said about how your, your commitment is revealed by your actions and impacts your actions. So I think there's sort of two things. One is, you know, you get the clarity in your, on your commitment and then you say, therefore, I'm going to take action in, in this area. But there's another thing that says, well, let's not even consider your commitment. Let's just look at what you are doing. You know, if you're allowing yourself to get busy, like what's that a commitment to? And for a lot of people, sometimes being really busy might be, you know, what they're committed to doing is being a jack of all trades with life. And maybe that's something they want to do, or it might be there's something a bit below the surface that's they might be committed to actually avoiding talking about something that's really going on. They might be committed to holding a, you know, 
holding a secret that that uh, that says they feel like a failure, or or um, that says that they uh, don't feel like they're good enough, and then they cover up with busyness. So it's it's where it's quite interesting to then just you know really take the time to say, well, what what's sitting behind the behaviour, and how can you really just learn to um, sort of ask that question at, at that level? So yeah, I, I think to to answer your question. I think sometimes people get in their own way. They can they can be overcommitted and they can just keep doing loads of things. And and the question then is not just like, uh, you know, are you committed to something or are you not? The question is just, well, let's just look at your actions and what does it show us about what you are committed to and is there a better way that you can express that commitment? Yeah, that's a good point. Hmm. And the, I suppose what you were talking about on enrollment about the fear that some people have the reservations on networking of you know I don't have anything to say or I might not be an expert in this so kind of feel uneasy about attending an event and having to talk to people who maybe are experts um and it is that you know it is that just asking questions and just being you don't need to ask necessarily intelligent questions but just start a conversation with someone um I suppose that leads on to my other question of how do you then find that balance between you're asking questions to form a relationship? How do you then balance between an actual personable relationship and a business relationship or a relationship with a, a business end goal? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's really hard. And I think that um, what I would probably encourage anyone listening and who's, who's interested in that kind of networking thing to do is, do you know what, if in doubt, are more on the side of build relationships just to get to know people and just to build relationships with people. I think that makes the world a much, a much better place. To be. And I don't mean that in like a kind of like Disney style, you know, like everything. <laughs> thing. But but I think that um, particularly within the context of of uh, Northern Ireland and, and the island of uh, the whole island, sorry, Ireland it's a small place, you know, and it's like things don't have, have to happen instantly. So, so I think that finding the balance between building a relationship just for the sake of getting to know someone and it being nice versus like having an, having an end goal. I think if you have an end goal, find ways to be explicit about that, you know, so if you are thinking, actually, I really need this done, or I'm interested in that, then just bring that to the surface. Because if you're pretending to do this and you're actually doing this, oftentimes we think we're much more subtle than we actually are <laughs> when in reality you know we can all read through someone when they're just trying to trying to uh, be calculated with this and actually we'd all probably respect it a bit more if someone's more likely to say look can I be honest with you here really enjoy what you're doing really enjoy how how uh, you go about your thing and I think we could help each other you know that's much better than kind of just the sort of skirting around the issue or pretending yeah. to be to be friends but yeah I, I'd say air more on that and it goes a bit to the time scale thing again of of sometimes like networking means we're speaking for five minutes at a speed dating type event and sometimes networking means um you know every now and again we'll drop each other a phone call and find out how things are find out about your family find out about your kids and maybe in six years time we end up doing a bit of work with each other or maybe it's that it's a bit uh, kind of even wider than that which is you might know someone who's interested in helping me out and I might know someone that's interested in helping you out and we never even explicitly have some kind of you know business with each other or whatever it's, it's just um yeah a, a nicer place to be do you think it's difficult for people to to kind of flip that relationship or maybe not entirely flip it but try and bring in the I suppose the business purpose when you already have a long-standing relationship you know, um, that story you told about someone mentioning that they they had a gap, like a skills gap, and you were able to suggest um, suggest something. If you were the other way around and you were maybe hoping to hoping to support without that gap being mentioned, do you find do you think that's quite difficult for people to know how to navigate that without ruining the initial relationship? Hmm. I th I think that's where if you can be someone who explores. What you're committed to or what type of things you're committed to and just practice articulating that with people i'd probably come from a place that says actually your commitments kind of start to line up with with uh with different areas of your life anyway and, and so therefore 
if you're building a really great personal relationship with someone, you start exploring kind of how do I talk about what I'm committed to, then actually the leap might not be so massive in, in the end, you know, if you've already started doing that. And, and a really great little tip I found if you if you have a relationship with someone where it feels like it's all personal and no business and you'd love to get business involved, then try framing it. And by framing, what I mean is almost like relationally put a, a bit of a line in the sand that says, oh, can I kind of pick your brains on something? I know this isn't the kind of thing we'd normally speak about, but would you be up for having a conversation about this? You know, and if you then frame that kind of conversation, they've got all the permission in the world to be like, nah, come on, we just like, <laughs> we just drink glasses of wine with each other. We don't, don't need to worry about that. And you're like, cool, oh, amazing. But I suspect that um, most people in the world, if you've got some kind of relationship, or could, would kind of be up for, yeah, you know, I'll explore that conversation. But I, th I think it then comes down to the thing I said a wee minute ago about, trying to be um, obvious or, or at least like speaking about what you're doing. You know, if there is a, a business goal in mind, then you no point in keeping it hidden. You know, it might be worth just saying, oh, look, can I just be honest with you? Here's one of the things that's on, on my mind, you know, and, yeah. and that helps you navigate. And I think that both aren't in opposition to each other at all. Actually, they start informing each other. You know, some of the um, best friends I have are people that I've worked with uh, and equally some of the uh, best clients that I have are people that I just had a good relationship with in the first place yeah it's just about managing it carefully and as you say using the informally trying to frame the conversation and give someone an out if they're mm -hmm. if they're not comfortable mm -hmm. um, and I have one final question which um, is probably your most frequently asked question at the moment <laughs> um, is uh, what do you think lockdown has done to people's ability to network and maybe their confidence in networking and what mm. advice would you give to people in moving back into the the real real fully formal dress and not just top half <laughs> formal dress uh, yeah, exactly. he's like I got my rugby shorts on under this um, <laughs> I don't I've got jeans on <laughs> but yeah um uh I I definitely noticed that within my clients what they are really good at doing is having the like big conversations because you still have to have the big conversations you know about actually just getting projects over the line or getting work done or you know signing new deals or whatever it is and they were quite good at doing the um small talk although we all know it's painful you know you have a zoom call and the first five minutes so how are you yeah well how's your weekend yeah good and then you're just kind of yeah. waiting to get onto it but you know to an extent it's been there and people were putting on you know social events or whatever but there's a lot of the middle ground conversation that has been lost a bit I think and, and I think the middle ground conversations are the sort of important but not urgent type of conversations which is the um the broad hey take a step back tell me a bit more about like you know what are you thinking for the next couple of years or, or are you exploring any other opportunities at the moment it, it's those types of conversations I think that people are are um are missing and, and looking forward to you know which then just come naturally and so then I think in terms of some advice I'd say there's nothing wrong with having in the back of your mind a couple of questions that you might just have to to ask people you know like we said when you ask questions the conversation's not going to die too quickly so yeah. maybe just have a couple of questions that you're genuinely interested in maybe if it's aligned to what you're committed to as well so I'm really committed to building relationships with people so I can help bring some psychological insight to them so I'll have a couple of questions that might be about like tell me a bit about like how how work's going for you like is there anyone in the team you're particularly enjoying or those those types of questions perfect brilliant thank you so much for today I mean uh, I think all of us have have taken away some really nice practical tips uh to help launch us into the real world again and uh, which is is going to be really beneficial for us all um, so I would highly, highly recommend everyone taking James up on his offer of uh, connecting with him when he moves over and joins us in, in Belfast. <laughs> um, and before I let everyone else go, um, just want to say again, huge thank you to James for your time today and huge thank you to Van Ra uh, for sponsoring. Um, so I think on that note, um, have a lovely weekend, everyone.